That's how we start, is we do it for them. And then we start to do it with them. And then they start to do it with us. And then they finally do it on their own. It's a process. Somebody asked me earlier if I'll do Q&A. Should I do, yeah. That's a good word. You made that up? Yeah, it's what you said. Yeah, it's Yeah, that's right. That's a good chidush. By the way, the entire chinuch today and everything really is v'yat titzave. Because what's the, the reality that the Rebbe describes in v'yat titzave? Is that all pressure from now on has to be self-induced. The gullus isn't going to smush us and we shouldn't step in and do it to anyone else and smush them the way the gullus smushed us. Today, everyone has to push himself. That's viata titzave. Anything else? Complaints? What? We'll go like this. Yeah. Okay, how do we weave, was that what your word, weave? Kabbalah's oil into this approach. Well, here's the beauty. We don't have to weave Kabbalah's oil into the approach. It's already right there. Okay, but, okay, let me bring it out. Let me explain it. You have to know what Kabbalah's oil really is. Kabbalah's oil is one of those weaponized words that people in authority use quite often when they're afraid. They feel threatened, so they say, have some Kabbalah soil, which really means they're trying to shut you down and make you be less than. Kabbalah soil is to make you be more than. The Rebbe explained, it's actually a Purm Fabregen, Tuf Shin Yud Tes, what true Kabbalah soil is. The Rebbe said, some people think that Seichel and Kabbalah's oil are mutually exclusive. In other words, you can't be self-disciplined and be a thinker at the same time. They just don't go together. One is always going to compromise the other. So the Rebbe said that actually that's untrue. Kabbalah's oil ultimately means that I submit myself to Hashem. Okay, I submit myself to Hashem. I'll do whatever you want. No, that's not submitting yourself. That's submitting part of yourself. Your action. I'll do whatever you want. But you have much more to yourself than just your koyach ha you're doing. Much more. What do, I, what do I have going, going on inside of me? I have seichel in midos. I have my unique perceptions and I have my emotions. That's my self, my whole self. So Kabbalah's oil means that you give yourself to Hashem. If you tell Hashem, God, I'm not going to think anymore. I'm just going to be from. You actually are denying Hashem, not only of part of you, but the best part of you, your seichel. So you're not allowed to say, I'm going to turn off my brain and just be a good boy or a good girl. True Kabbalah's oil means I'm going to train myself how to think in a holy way, in a godly way. Not, I'm going to stop thinking. I'm going to start thinking, but I'm going to think like a Jew. I'm going to think like a Nefesh kiss, Which means what we've been saying here. The true education is that instead of forcing somebody to do something they don't want, you bring out of them what they truly want, and then you align all parts of them to that truest desire. All parts meaning not only your will and your beliefs, but the way your mind operates and your heart, your emotions, and ultimately, yes, of course, your action. So... It's integrity in the truest sense of the word. Integrity means 
to be integrated. To be integrated means that there's no discrepancy on any level with another level of myself. That I'm not fragmented from myself. When I'm integrated, that means that my beliefs and my desires and the way my mind operates and my emotions and my attractions and my desires and my behaviors are all consistent. So when we take a scalpel out and remove any part of that in order to achieve Kabbalah's oil, you're actually not doing Kabbalah's oil at all. You're doing the opposite. So if we want to have true Kabbalah's oil, that means we're going to have to actually have thoughtful conversations. We're going to have to explain things to people. Starting with the concept of Kabbalah's oil. You know, you can't have Kabbalah's oil to the concept of Kabbalah's oil. Everything has to start somewhere. In other words, intelligently explain to me why Kabbalah's oil is important. And then later, after you've explained it to me, you can invoke that principle. And you could say, let's have Kabbalah's oil. There's a letter from the Rebbe in the Igris. The Rebbe is writing to a, a woman, a teacher. And he tells her, when you teach your students, they were teenagers in Israel. When you teach your students about Kabbalah's oil, you should explain to them that it's good for them. And that and this line shocked me. And that secular science has confirmed this. Is that fascinating? That sounds antithetical to Kabbalah soil. If it's Kabbalah soil, then I don't need to know that it's good for me. I don't need to know that the Goyim agree with it. Who cares? If it's Kabbalah soil, it's Kabbalah soil. Just do it. But you understand what the Rebbe is saying here? When you teach them Kabbalah's oil, explain to them the reason for it. Explain to them how it benefits them. Explain to them how it makes them have a better life. Explain to them, and this part blew me away, why from a purely secular, non-Jewish, scientific approach, meaning leaving aside any spiritual talk, explain to them why it's a good thing. So, the way that Rebbe describes Kabbalah soil, and especially teaching children about Kabbalah soil, sounds a lot different than the way many of us may have seen it taught and talked about. Does that make sense? Yeah, okay. What is Kabbalah soil? It's giving all of yourself to Hashem. Your entire self. Yeah? Let me go to the way back there, yeah. Right. If the Seichel doesn't understand, so we have to work on it. It's a process. These are deep concepts. Don't just say, well, I thought about it, it didn't make sense. That's the whole point of education. The whole point of education is that it's going to be a process. It's going to take time to understand these ideas. That's why we were given an entire childhood to, to learn how to be adults. Okay. A child could say, I don't understand, therefore I'm not going to do it. All right. First of all, let me ask you a question. Are, are we afraid of that? <laughs> then nothing else is going to go. You know, if you're still afraid of that... Ladies, let me, let me tell you something. If we're still dreading our child saying to us, if I don't understand it, I'm not going to do it, then we can't parent them. You're going to have to get over your fears. Do you understand why you can't parent them until you get over this fear? Because as long as you're afraid, then it's all going to be about power and control. And you're not going to be able to teach them anything. The best you'll be able to accomplish is to force them into behavioral compliance. Which means as soon as you leave the room, they're going to do what they wanted to do all along anyway. So we can't be afraid of them voicing their opinions. We have to, we have to work with their opinions. Like 
Right, but that itself is an explanation, is a rational explanation. And that's our job as parents, to explain. Even when you tell a child that they should listen to their mother and father because their mother and father say so, that itself should be explained. They have minds. The proof of it is if you don't teach them how to use their minds, they use their minds to rebel, God forbid. So that they have enough of a mind to figure out how to rebel, they have enough of a mind to figure out how to understand the duties that they already have. It's our job to, to help them wrap their minds around that. Anything else? Okay. You were the person to ask me if there's going to be Q&A, and you waited so patiently. So this is the last one. You don't know if it's practical? Okay. Okay, no problem. Okay. Yeah. 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 So the question was, you want your two-year-old daughter to clear her plate after, yeah, well, your two, she's, her experience is with a two-year-old. So that's why she said two-year-old. She, she wasn't making it up. That's, right? This is a real two-year-old daughter? Right? Okay. You didn't just make that scenario up so you could have a question to ask, right? Okay, what? Okay. Uh-huh, Okay. Did everyone hear the question? Okay. The question was, I have a two-year-old daughter, and I want her to clear her plate after she finishes eating. And what did you say? You told her to do it? She said no. You do it. She said you do it. Okay. Okay. So it's, it's interesting, the emotional reaction, by the way. Did you hear the collective gasp? Like, you triggered something in the room. And by the way, you have a two-year-old saying, no, you do it. Some of the people here are like, oh, try, you know, 10-year-old, 15-year-old, 20-year-old. So, uh, it's our job not to tell our children to do things that they're not going to be able to do. And at the same time, it's our job to get them to eventually do things that they weren't able to do. You hear that? It's our job not to tell them to do things that they're not able to do, and at the same exact time, it's our job to get them to become able to do things that they weren't able to do. So it's a process. It's not binary, yes or no, black and white. My child will listen or not. It's a process. In this case, what are we discussing? We're, we're trying to achieve a goal of getting this child at some point, she's only two now, but at some point we want her to actually clear her plate. Not only when you ask her to, she'll clear her plate. What do we really want? That she'll clear her plate because you told her to? No, that's not what we really want. What do we really want? She'll do it on her own. In fact, we want her to become the kind of young lady who, if she got up and accidentally left the room and realized she hadn't cleared her plate, she will feel compelled to go back because it'll bother her. Right? That's what we really want. Okay. Are you willing to give it time? That's my first question to you. 
Are you, are you willing to engage this as a process? See, instead of looking at it as a power struggle of, can I get her to do it or not? Which then you basically have two options. Either she listens or she doesn't listen. Either you succeed and you fail. But even when you succeed, you failed because success in that scenario is forcing her to do something she doesn't really want to do and she never learns how to want to do it. So even success is failure. As opposed to what? Making a commitment to the long haul that it's going to take years for the child to actually care about clearing her own plate. The first stage of that process may very well be that at the end of the meal, you pick up the plate, and very loudly narrate what you're doing. It's the end of the meal. We're clearing our plate. Everybody throws their plate away. That's how we start, is we do it for them. And then we start to do it with them. And then they start to do it with us. And then they finally do it on their own. It's a process. And Hashem's going to help you. He is helping you with this process. Okay. Everyone should have lots and lots of nachas.